Bienvenido a this episode of Potterless. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, in January, I was a part of PodCon. I was on two panels with Multitude, one of which was about pre-production for a podcast, so before you launch it, all the steps that you can take to set yourself up for future success, and one about sponsorships, so that if you are running a show, how you can secure different ad deals, whether you're a big show, a small show, whatever. The audio from those two panels is now live. If you go to multitude.production slash resources, you can check it out there. And there's a bunch of other articles there about running a podcast or starting a podcast, anything like that. So all of that is available and live now. You can hear what we said at PodCon if you go to multitude.productions slash resources. This is the first episode in March, and here at Potterless, each month we donate $1 to a different charity based on how many patrons we have over at our team at patreon.com slash Potterless. And at the time of recording, we have 700 patrons, meaning we are giving $700 to Puppy Haven Rescue in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I wanted to switch it up this time because I haven't done any sort of animal rights charity yet, and a lot of the charities I've done are bigger organizations. This one was suggested to me by Katie, who said the charity is really small, so the money could really do a lot for them. And she says a lot of the people on the board are producers little patrons, which is so fantastic. So I think this is a great use of money. They do a lot of really great things for different dogs. They have 68 dogs in their rescue. They've adopted out 57 in 2019, which is great. It's only March. And they've rescued over 672 dogs since May 2017. If you want to learn more about the services that they do, you can go to puppyhavenrescue.com. And thanks, Katie, and the whole team for supporting and reaching out. And speaking of people supporting, we have new patrons, so welcome to the team. So shout out to Brianna Clark, Anthony Tabachi, Keaton, Inc. Curry Parman, Laura May, Jessica Morrison, Sid Sitzel Billy Nielsen, Reco Rickenen, Catherine Gilbert, Serena Ortiz, Molly Flood, Morgan McLeod, Helen, and Al Vega. Shout out to Maya Gray, Addie Ray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, and Kimberly Savage, who upgraded to producer level status. And thanks to our new producer level patrons, Swirjan Thanme Gupta, Brittany Gutierrez, and Sarah Shecker. They joined the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah Clow, Frank Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Kieran, Rebecca Abid, Caitlin, Rosemary, Jill, Marie, Lisa, Ariel, Romina, Kamel, Russell, Dustin, Audra, Eleanor, Sydney, Billy, Rossanne, Andrea, Nikita, Lala, Chelsea, Taylor, Lovekesh, Ali, Cassandra, Roxy, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Jessica, Arna, Tiago, Daisy, Jessica, Orchid, Steve, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Marino, Moster, Pinky, Angelina, Ross, Marie, Phineas, Lee, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Finn, Mosin, Grace, Sammy, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Brianne, Heidi, Alexandra, John, Jen, Noel, Tao, Hala, Emily, Michael, Robin, Patricia, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Teal, Cena, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Alicat, Holly, Veronica, Kevin, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Lucinda, Carlos, Pam, Nikki, Colleen, Jennifer, Frieda, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Carrie, Andrea, Topher, Ella, Anthony, Weekend of Dead, Cat Ladies, David, Elisa, Lynn, Emily, Ryan, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, and Can't I Potter? Who never do that thing where you trip going up the stairs and look absolutely ridiculous. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to bonus episodes, exclusive merchandise, discounts on the merch store, you can go to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 67 of Potterless, covering chapters 14 and 15 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows guest starring Multitude's own Eric Silver. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Potterless, a Harry Potter podcast about someone who hasn't read the books before. My name is Mike Schubert, and this intro sounds a little different because I'm mimicking the intro that I do for Horse, my other podcast that I co-host with Eric Silver. Hey, guess who's here? <gasps> it's Eric Silver. Oh, hello. Welcome. Welcome to our new show. It's a combination of Horse. <laughs> It's a combination of Horace and Potterless, which is all about Quidditch. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to come in and say, sup, nerds. I was thinking about it, but you I wanted to mirror. I want to do what I usually do, which is I just like, oh, hello, <laughs> Michael Schubert. <laughs> so, yes, if you have not listened to our podcast, Horse, you're doing it wrong. It's a very fun basketball <laughs> podcast that's about everything that is not basketball. But that is not what we're here to discuss today. We are here to discuss chapters 14 and 15 of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And Eric, I specifically had you on for these two chapters. Plan this long in advance because everyone warned me that the camping in this book sucks. And it's these the are the worst. first camping chapters we get. It's so bad. I feel like this like strikes a real good balance between my previous episodes. Like my first two were all about like teenage bullshit, which was really fun and easy to make fun of. Mm -hmm. And then the more recent one at the beginning of Deathly Hallows was like very serious. Yeah. Very, very <laughs> serious, very fast. 
And I feel like this is a very good in between where it's like this is kind of serious, but also very easy to make fun of teenagers. Yes, it's mostly very dumb. And even the seriousness is Ron being a jerk. So let's stop beating around the bush and let's get right into chapter 14, which is called The Thief. So after the botched apparition from last chapter, Harry comes to in a forest and the squad is with him. There's only one tiny detail. Uh, Ron's shoulder didn't make the trip. <laughs> uh, it got splinched. And there's this interesting quote from the narrator that says, Harry always thought of splinching as something comical, which I'm sorry, what? People losing their limbs is funny to you, Harry? How twisted are you? It sounds tragic. We're not talking about Lego pieces here, dog. These are humans. I know. Magicians have such a dark sense of humor. And I don't, I know I said magicians and I meant wizards, but I'm going to stay with magicians. Nope, no, 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 no. Miel Bredo would very much support you calling them magicians. Uh, David Blaine and Harry Potter both have very dark senses of humor. It's like they just seen too much shit. Chris Angel is definitely a Hogwarts student. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Blaine, prefect at Hogwarts. <laughs> Chris Angel's like the guy who tried to get in the Death Eaters, but they didn't let him. <laughs> Voldemort, you're about to get mind freaked. I have the mind freak. <laughs> I don't need this mind freak. Can you mind freak the boy who lived? I remember for about two weeks, mind freak was cool. And then during week three, I realized, wait, this is all very fake and very camera trick reliant. I can make the boy who lived float and he won't know why. Ooh, Mind Freak. The episode that did it for me in Mind Freak was when he walked across the pool and he said he could walk on water. And he did it while holding this really old janky looking camcorder. And he's never done that with any other Mind Freak trick before. And clearly, this camera let him know where the plastic blocks were for to where to step. Oh, God. And from that moment on, I was out on Mind Freak. So, yeah, Chris Angel would never make it into Hogwarts. Nah, or the Death Eaters. So, Nothing. Hermione tells Harry to get the essence of Dittany out of her bag. And he does so with Accio. And then she tells him to, quote, unstopper it for me, which means we need to call upon UK correspondent Dottie James. And now it is time for British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. Hold on, Dottie, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it has like a stopper on it. Like it's a bottle that has like a cork, but it's also called a stopper when you're talking about medicine. I mean, I think it's as indelicate as J.K. Rowling sometimes writes. She literally means unstopper it, like pull the stopper out. I understand what it means, but I've just never heard anything referred to as that. I would either say, like, take the cap off or unscrew it or something. Even if someone had like a wine bottle with one of those wine stoppers in it, I don't think I would say unstopper this. And I wonder if that's a British thing people actually say. I'm thinking of like a tincture, medicine specifically, like something like chemicals. Like maybe if you had, um, w uh, what's the stuff that you put on cuts to disinfect them? Uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. I feel like that comes with a stopper. It's like you need something plastic to keep corrosive liquid in. That just comes with a cap. Maybe I just have never come across something aside from wine that you have a stopper in. But I just, I don't know if unstopper is a common thing in the UK, which is why I'm calling upon UK correspondent Dottie James. <laughs> <laughs> and now it is time for British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. So to unstop something is just to uncork it. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dotty James. Wow, Dottie, thanks so much. Look how many more things we know. I'm so educated now. <laughs> I'm so glad you supported me in whatever I said. <laughs> so she applies the essence of Dittany to Ron's missing shoulder, and he starts to look better already. And Harry is impressed. Hermione is afraid to do any healing charms in case she messes them up. And here's a question. Why isn't this a class at Hogwarts? It seems like healing charms are very important, and I don't understand why Hermione Granger, who knows everything and goes above and beyond what they teach in the classroom, if she's... Still too afraid to do a healing charm? They probably should teach this in school. Or is the allegory here supposed to be that there is wizarding medical school that you go to after you graduate Hogwarts, and that's what Madame Pomfrey did? 
and maybe Molly Weasley. Probably. I think that's what she was going for. Okay. But at the same time, I agree with you. They should at least teach them basic stuff in Defense Against the Dark Arts, right? If the whole thing is protecting against harmful magic, you would think one of the courses would be like, hey, sometimes people are going to injure you. Here's how you make sure you don't bleed to death. Here's Band-Aidicus, you know, something. <laughs> this is the equivalent of the fact that we don't get taught anything about taxes or, like, basic budgeting in high school. You just, like, get thrown to college. So I think that this might be that equivalent. Every now and then, one of my friends will say that their high school taught them stuff like that, and I'm so jealous. So jealous. I wish I would have had that. And thankfully, my mom was an accountant, so that made things very easy. The two biggest blessings in my life in terms of taxes and stuff like that is that my mom is an accountant, and one of the guys who sat near me during the first couple weeks of my first job out of college, he was a finance major. So I had two very important people in my life telling me about how to do taxes and the importance of investing in a Roth IRA, which has saved me lots of tax dollars in the future. Man. There you go. So Harry then asks why they are where they are. And Hermione explains that when she went to disapparate, Yaxley grabbed a hold of her tightly. And once she saw the door to Grimald Place, he started to loosen his grip, thinking that it was the end of the voyage. So Hermione then hit him with a revulsion jinx and then went to the first place that she could think of that would be safe, which was this forest. Hmm. The problem with this, though, is that since Yaxley getting pushed off happened within the range of the Fidelius charm, the secret keeping has now been revealed, giving him and now the Death Eaters access to Grimald Place. Basically, they can't go back to Grimald Place anymore. Ah, beans. Yeah, which stinks. And my first thought, which is Harry's third thought, is, oh no, what's going to happen to Creature? I like him now and I'm scared. I'm afraid they're going to be mean to him. I don't know. Creature still sucks. I thought he sucked, but you, when you put in perspective that if people treat him nicely, he is nice, that's something I can at least get behind. And once he was good to the squad, he was so good to the squad, cooking him food and checking in on him and helping him out with the whole Horcrux thing. He's a good dude. He was just hated by Sirius, but also I understand why Sirius hated him, but I feel like he's misunderstood. I mean, Harry says this in a few pages from now. That it's like they've only been really like decent to each other for a month. Who knows how loyal he's going to be? True. Probably just going to talk to the Death Eaters when they kick in his door. We'll have to see. Because the Death Eaters are kind of the reason that Regulus is dead. And we basically learn that above all else, Creature loves Regulus. So maybe he has somewhat of a disdain toward the Death Eaters. But then Bellatrix is in there, so maybe Bellatrix turns him. Who knows? Maybe we'll find out later in the books. I'm not sure. Who can say? I wonder if J.K. Rowling ties everything up with a bow. Who, who really knows? And if she didn't, she'll tweet about it later and ruin it. So Hermione Man. frantically apologizes, and Harry doesn't let her, saying that it's his fault for taking Mad-Eye Moody's eye out of Umbridge's door, which it was, honestly. This all could have been avoided if he didn't just rip her dang door apart. Ron then wakes up and asks where they are. Hermione tells him that it's the forest of the Quidditch World Cup, and oh boy, just when I think I've escaped this damn sport, it comes back. Yeah, and then they start playing Quidditch for the rest of this chapter to get their minds off of all of their troubles. And then the so rest of weird. the book. It's so crazy. They just go over the finer points in all 7,000 and a half fouls there are in Quidditch. 700 fouls. 700. 7,000 and a half. That's what I said. And you know what none of the fouls are? That a dog can't play Quidditch. <laughs> Air Bud 12. It's Quidditch now. <laughs> um. Oh, no. I have this. Uh, uh, Jack Russell Beater. Eh. Is that a thing? No. Nah. A golden seeker retriever? Uh, You could do snitch because a bitch is the technical term for a female dog. <laughs> Listen, when you're throwing up technicalities, it's probably not a good joke. Huh? <laughs> Quaffle hound. Uh, golden chaser. Qu uh, That's okay. Quit, I mean, quit, quit, bitch. The <laughs> See, now here's me running through, <laughs> threading through dog breeds, and you're like, what sounds like bitch? <laughs> Airbud 12, quit, bitch. <laughs> it's your podcast. <laughs> We've got the explicit E. It's fine. So Harry again thinks about how the Death Eaters found them so quickly last time, and he is on edge. He is not very comfortable with them being on the run and not in a safe place like Grimald Place. Hermione gets up and starts putting protective charms all around their campsite. She does Salvio Hexia, 
Protego Totalum, Repelio Muggletum, and Muffliato. I wrote these down just because I think this might be a question in Harry Potter trivia later in my life. I, the only one that I couldn't guess was Salvio Hexia. I bet it's like Salvio sounds like salve or just like some sort of protection. So it's just like a basic hex protection spell. Oh, yes, you're right. So it literally, the Latin is save from hexes. So yeah, it's bow, bow, bow. anti-hex charm. Look at you. I'm not even a Latin champion like Michael Schubert. I am. And people are going to get mad at me. Someone on Twitter, <laughs> I don't know if I said this the podcast, someone on Twitter once just replied and said, we get it, you took Latin in high school. <laughs> hey, me and that person from Twitter agrees. That's so crazy. <laughs> It was me. It was at El Silvero. That was me tweeting. (laughs) So while she's putting up all these charms, she turns to Harry and says, you could get the tent out, Harry, dot, 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 which the sass. I love it. Uh, And speaking of this, I one time got a one star review on Potterless. They said, stop calling everyone sassy. (laughs) Also me. That was also me. (laughs) Uh, Let's go camping. Let's go camping. Here it comes. Let's go camping. So they have the same tent from the World Cup, so the big old fancy tent. Hermione tops it all off with Cave Inimicum, which is another protector charm over the tent, and Hermione says that the charms will at least let them know if the Death Eaters are coming, but it can't keep out Voldemort, and she gets halfway through saying Voldemort, but Ron interrupts to say, let's try not saying his name. He thinks that it's some sort of jinx or bad luck, something that it's not a good idea for them to keep saying it, and he cites Dumbledore not turning out too well, and Dumbledore is the other person we know who says Voldemort and not you know who or he must not be named or the dark lord or whatever and he was like look the only other guy who did it is dead so maybe we should stop which is pretty sound logic by ron i had a head cannon while i was reading the books after voldemort came back in book four mm-hmm. i thought that when people started saying his name it was like a homing sort of thing like he was attracted to the sound of his name because he and then as the books went forward like his souls were so spread out and he kind of had ears everywhere as we mm-hmm. hear from his relationship with harry and just like the fact that he kind of spreads himself out that like when you say voldemort he knows where he, you are so rereading this i'm like yeah ron if you're trying to hide from voldemort that's a very good idea i agree with you man without a shoulder i think that it might be a thing that comes up later in the book because i have brought up on this podcast before confusion as to why they don't just say his name and i believe people have told me that you learn about it later so i would not be surprised if ron turns out to be correct and then later in the book you find out that there is something whether it's making him stronger or like you were saying some sort of homing thing where if someone says it he his spider sense his voldemort sense tingles or something his serpent sense oh nice nice do you even read harry potter are you even reading the books yes professionally (laughs) so harry starts to give dumbledore's fear of a name argument but ron says can we just not say it and give him some respect and harry does not take kindly to this thought he's about to go ape shit on ron for saying we should respect him but then hermione shoots him a look to back off since ron is missing a shoulder and we should probably take it easy on him Jeez. so hermione then makes some tea because she's the only one doing anything and they then worry about the catamoles for a bit Ron especially because he got the vibe that Reg was not that smart based on how everyone was treating him when he was disguised as Reg Cattermole. So the three of them are worried that they might be responsible if the Cattermoles end up in Azkaban. So hopefully they're just dandy. You mean my greatest fear when someone else is disguised as me and they realize that everyone talks about me when I'm not there and I just didn't know it? There it is. Thank you, Ron. (laughs) So Harry asks Hermione if she has the locket and Ron then blurts out, you got it? No one tells me anything, which is amazing. Absolutely incredible. And also very true. So they believe it's still a Horcrux and that creature is right. They must find a way to open it in order to destroy it. They all try various charms to no avail, though. They decide that they'll keep it safe until they figure out how to destroy it. 
Ron is still a bit woozy, so Harry and Hermione split playing lookout while the other one rests. It's funny that you mentioned them going on watch because we talk about the sneak scope that Hermione has given Harry for his birthday. So they're using that as like part of their spy mission. And this feels like the end of a Dungeons and Dragons campaign where you have all these items that you haven't used. And now you're like, oh, man, it's ending soon. I'm just going to use all the stuff I have in my backpack. Yeah, I can see it because what does the sneak scope actually do? Doesn't it just let you know if someone is doing charms near you or something yeah it's honestly i don't remember what it does i just assumed it was about something sneaky okay <laughs> uh, i've talked to my harry potter consultant and uh, <laughs> amanda mclaughlin sitting next to you in the yeah room. <laughs> amanda who's sitting over here and <laughs> the sneaker scope just detects sketchy people who are around this is like jk rowling putting earlier in the campaign that like they have this item and then like a hundred sessions later the players are like i'm gonna use the sneaker scope and you're like what is that i don't remember what it is and now of course they're using it exactly for the thing that it should have been used for hermione has a bag of holding where she's keeping all of this random stuff in mm -hmm. and they just keep pulling stuff out that would be perfect for their campaign i feel like this is also something that happened last chapter when they finally use a decoy detonator because we've heard about them mm -hmm. for a couple books but never use them so yeah maybe jk rowling is getting to the last book and she's like oh man i haven't used all these things let's just use them all this is also like very concrete danger which i think is interesting in a way that book five and six didn't necessarily have that much so book four was like all challenges and now seven is like very concentrated action sequences we're talking about the wedding we're talking about all of these escaping from dementors now we have the camping stuff and then of course the denouement you know it's the climax of the entire series shit's about to pop off so she has like very defined actions. Ma, look at you. English major, what up? Beow, 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 beow. Which is not the same as climax, but it's the climax. And then the Ma. I'm very aware of how the witch's hat, I know how that works. Cool. So now that everyone has stopped listening to Potter, let's oh, oh, they all love listening to English major and English majors talk about the slope of plot development. Believe me. All right, so the problem with packing oh, is that Mike they loves brought... math. Oh, let me talk about math and fucking quadratic formulas and shit. Ooh, I mean, I do love the quadratic formula. They hadn't packed food, unfortunately, because the plan was to go back to Grimald Place afterwards. So the only thing that they can eat is wild mushrooms that Hermione has collected from nearby trees and stewed in a billy can. Uh, billy can, is this a normal thing or is this a British thing? I have no idea what a billy can is. Dottie James, help! <laughs> And now it is time for British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dotty James. A billy can is something I had to look up because I'm not a camping person. But apparently, yes, it comes from Scotland originally and then moved to Australia as more of an Australian thing. But apparently we still say it. So there is your very confusing British Quandary. This has been British Quandaries with UK correspondent Dottie James. Thanks, Dottie. Wow, I now know what a billy can is. Whoa, billy? No way. Crazy. But here's the thing. Hermione is the only person keeping them alive. She set up the tents. Yep. She set up the charms. Yep. She made tea. Yep. She got the mushrooms. Yep. She's cooked the mushrooms. Mm -hmm. They would all be dead without Hermione Granger. That's the thesis of the entire book series isn't it mm, it really is on the day of recording this is hermione granger's birthday so how fitting hey happy birthday hermione or hermione is everyone who read to themselves until the fourth movie came out or no the fourth book came out because the fourth book it tells you how to pronounce it oh that's right yeah and jk rowling recently confirmed on twitter is that that's why they wrote crumb doing that in the books was explicitly because people were mispronouncing hermione which i think is amazing Ron pushes the mushrooms away after eating only a few of them. He's feeling queasy. Harry only finished them to not hurt Hermione's feelings, which then get off your ass and catch a squirrel. Like do Accio squirrel and then kill it and cook it, right? Like isn't wizard hunting the easiest thing? Can't you just Accio the animal you're trying to hunt? I feel like you could just do that. In the next chapter. They Accio salmon. They say Accio salmon and yeah. then they get hit in the chest with salmon. But it which works. I love. Wizard fishing is really boring. <laughs> So, yeah, they probably could. I didn't know that you could do that to animals. They accio salmon, so I guess so. I guess so. 
Accio quail, Accio squirrel, Accio, I don't know, apples, and maybe one flies from an orchard far away. Yeah, they could also just be like Accio sandwich, and a sandwich would appear. Yeah, if someone was close enough. That was the thing. Later in this chapter, when they go sneaking into town or whatever, why don't they just try to Accio things? Accio pizza, Accio coffee. Well, first of all, you do not want to go to a sleepy British town and Accio pizza, oh, first true. of all. Ugh. Yeah, you'd have to explicitly Accio Indian food because <laughs> my belief is that the only good food in London is Indian food. Everything else is trash. Accio chicken masala. <laughs> no, that's not it. Accio tikka masala. Yeah, chicken tikka masala is a type of tikka masala. Accio bangers. Accio panapuri. Accio fish and chips. Uh, eh. The fact that that is like their go-to food makes me sad. What's wrong with fish and chips? It's not that it's bad, but it's like this is their quintessential meal. Like Spain's quintessential meal is paella, which is incredible. Right. And Mexico, you could say like burritos or enchiladas or something phenomenal or fajitas. But then you go to Britain, it's like, yeah, it's like shitty fried white fish and potato chips. Yeah. (laughs) Potato chips, not crisps or fries. Accio crisps. Accio crisps. (laughs) Accio warm beer. I would have fucking walk into the Wizarding World of Harry Potter and just be like, Accio rides. I want to go on the ride. This is a question for anyone that works in Harry Potter world. How many people go to the three broomsticks and then instead of ordering a butterbeer like a normal human being, they turn to the bartender and they say, Accio butterbeer. And they think they're amazing, but they're the worst. I want to say... 99% of people. I'm going to say one out of every seven people do it, and it's funny zero out of every seven times. Oh, it is not funny. Not at all. It was funny the first day that it opened, and then afterwards, not funny. It reminds me of, I was at an improv festival in Hawaii, and there was this one person there who was awful. He was so bad. He was not, uh, just the worst type of person. He was in line to get tickets to one of the shows, and when he got to the ticket booth and ask for a ticket they said ten dollars the price of the ticket and rather than be a normal human and give the lady a ten dollar bill or a credit card or whatever he dinged a bell that was on her desk and he said new choice which is an improv game and i've never felt more embarrassed to be someone that does improv comedy ever i wanted to leave the island and go away forever and that's what Accio Butterbeer makes me think of. And I'm dying inside. Wow, I hate that. I hope that guy is not alive anymore. He doesn't get to be alive and interact in human society. The problem was he did awful things throughout this entire festival where he was just like trying way too hard to be funny and just making people uncomfortable. And he had the same last name as one of the guys on my improv team. And the guy on my team felt absolutely embarrassed because he just thought people were going to think they were brothers or something. He's like, this guy's the worst. I hate this. That's terrible. It was bad. Super bad. So Harry has some dread about not knowing what the other Horcruxes are and not knowing how to destroy the only one that they have. He goes on to describe the one that they have. He says it's so cold that it feels like it just came out of something icy, like it just came out the freezer. And it has a tiny heartbeat in it, which is a small detail, but a terrifying detail. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we'll go into this later, but it's like, hey, Harry, if it has a heartbeat, Don't keep this on your body. Don't put it against your chest. Just don't do it. They talk about switching this out. I don't get why they don't just keep it in Hermione's bag. Yes. Right? Why didn't they just do that? We're going to talk about this more in the next chapter, but I have strong feelings about this. So this leads into a Voldemort scar teleportation, see what he's seeing session. And through Voldemort's eyes, Harry sees Voldemort interrogating Grigorovich, who is upside down and wrapped up in a weird contortionist way. And he says that he doesn't have what Voldemort is looking for. He says that it was stolen away from him many years ago. And then we get to something that makes me so sad, because up until this point, I loved Voldemort's theatrics, but... Voldemort talks about himself in the third person, Mm. which makes me so upset. Uh, He says, do not lie to Lord Voldemort, Grigorovich. He knows. He always knows, which uh, makes me very sad. It worries me how good your Voldemort (laughs) impression is. I don't like it. (laughs) Uh, I love doing it. I like that. And then my Snape voice is just like kind of Squidward. (laughs) (laughs) Your identification with Voldemort is so worrisome. (laughs) 
we we've, we've talked it's about this on Voldemort. Come agent. on, he's a performer. <laughs> <laughs> Voldemort apologist Mike Schubert. <laughs> All I'm saying <laughs> is that there are two people worse than Voldemort in the books, and it's Umbridge and Percy. Oh, obviously no. Voldemort is the worst person because he murders people. Blah 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 blah. But. I still hold to this day, and I will defend this, that Umbridge is a better villain because Umbridge is more similar to people that we have come across in our real lives. Like the chances of someone actually coming across a Dolores Umbridge, someone that abuses their power or mishandles information or is unjust to people in a lower status than them, we've all come across some sort of Dolores Umbridge in our lives. We probably have not come across someone that is a mass murderer, you're not going to be like, oh yeah, my neighbor Todd, serial killer. Ugh, can't stand that guy. Like that, there's no way to relate Voldemort to someone you know because he's just so ridiculously evil. But Umbridge, you can see in your life. And same thing with Percy. I hear you, but you might be the only person who's considering getting a Voldemort tattoo. I mean, yeah. No, people get the dark mark tattoo, which is weirder. Do they? Because that's literally like the like the swastika. the swastika. Yeah. People do that. They're like, oh, yeah, it's Harry Potter. It's like, did you not read the book part? Yeah, they're called Nazis. <laughs> Nazis love fantasy, too. I don't know. Anytime I see someone with that tattoo, if you're not cosplaying, that's terrifying. Oh, yeah. Like, that's no, not no. cool at all. Zero percent. Actually, greater than zero percent. Yo, yo, it's editing, Mike. I'm here to say that last week I was tweeted at by listener Monet, who says that she has a dark mark tattoo. She says she got it after her abusive husband left her as a symbol that people make bad choices, but we can be redeemed. She was inspired by the Death Eaters like Regulus, who regretted their choice to follow Voldemort. So I stand corrected. You can have a good dark mark tattoo. You just need meaning behind it like Monet. We've done so much good foreshadowing in this chapter that we're going to get to in the next chapter. I'm very excited. I'm going to hold on. To that. Yeah, I mean, it'll be in the same episode, so don't worry. And we're almost done with this chapter. So Voldemort then does legilimens on Grigorovich, and he sees a vision of a young man with golden hair. And this is the same description that we got in the previous chapter when there was a picture of Dumbledore next to someone that looked happy with golden hair. And my guess is that this is Grindelwald, only because I know that Dumbledore and Grindelwald have some sort of history together. And Grindelwald is like kind of evil and stealing stuff. Or he's not kind of evil. He's very evil. And stealing stuff stuff from a wand maker seems evil. So it's unfortunate that I kind of know this uh, just based on there being a Crimes of Grindelwald movie coming out and stuff like that. But this is at least my guess. It's an informed guess, which is not as much fun when I guess stuff out of the blue when I'm super wrong about Ludo Bagman or super right about Madame Rose Murta. Gotta get your wins when they come, I guess. Yep, gotta, after you're super wrong about stuff, you finally get one win. So Voldemort asks who the thief was, and Grigorovich says that he doesn't know. Voldemort then kills Grigorovich, which seems unnecessary, and Hermione then snaps Harry out of it. She, of course, is mad that he's doing the whole scar thing and not actually putting any effort into occlumency. And Harry lies, saying that it was a dream. And she says, oh, well, if you're falling asleep and dozing off, maybe I should take over as lookout. And Harry's like, no, 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 I'm fine. And she's like, no, go back. I'll be the lookout. Harry wanted to tell Hermione what he saw, but she doesn't want to give any sort of justification to Harry continuing to be okay with doing these little teleportation things. So she doesn't let him say it. So Harry then has to go and tell Ron. And of course, Ron's down for it. That's how Ron works. Ron, always down for bad things. (laughs) So Ron then brings up that Voldemort doing all of this doesn't make any sense if Grigorovich was supposed to be making a wand for Voldemort. And this is why my guess is that It's a wand that's already made that Voldemort is trying to steal. Mm. That would just be my guess. I can't think of anything else to try to take from a wand maker except for a wand. And Ron is right. If he's not searching over Grigorovich to make him a special wand, my guess is that he has some sort of special wand. Maybe it's a powerful wand or an evil wand or something. And then Voldemort is trying to get his hands on it. So this is my guess. And that's what Ron helped me realize is that he's right. 
Because it, it doesn't make sense to kill him if he if you need him to make you something. Well, maybe Grigorovich has, you know, the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. And Voldemort just really wants that recipe so he can open up his chicken restaurant. Is KFC chicken even that good? I feel like it's not. It's not. But yeah. it's, it was pretty funny for this joke, I thought. No, I get the joke. I, I support the joke. <laughs> but my bigger concern is that I don't think KFC chicken's that good. It's not. It's not. And they brag about having the special recipe and blah, blah, blah. But, like, I'd rather go to Raising Cane's. Fair. Oh, there are plenty of more uh, fried chicken places. Um, story about KFC. One time in college, I went in with my friend Joe to go get the Double Down when it just came out. Oh, nice. And we both ordered Double Downs. And we were just, like, kind of joking and talking to each other. And the woman at the front then asked if we were on a date together. <gasps> nice. And I wasn't offended that she asked me that we were on a date together. I was offended that she thought that I would bring my date to a KFC and buy him a double down. Yeah. Like what kind of a person do you think I am that I'm a KFC date person? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, first date, you make food together. Second date, KFC. And third date, Taco Bell for Doritos Locos Tacos. Yeah. And then you meet each other's parents. And then on your wedding invitations, you have choice of meal and it's either double down or Doritos Locos Tacos. <laughs> the, the foods that made us love each other. You know what sucks is that someone is had a wedding catered by fast food someone has done that i bet and that makes me sad and they thought it was awesome oh i'm sure <laughs> i think if i went to that wedding and they did it i'd be like oh cool okay i'm glad that you made that choice for yourself i'm not going to do that but i'm glad <laughs> i could experience it like thank you for letting me come to this thing for free i appreciate it it's like when someone hosts some sort of party that's very messy like i don't want to say a foam party is cool but Something to that effect where you do something and you're like, wow, I'm glad I'm at this party and I don't live in this apartment. Right. Oh, yeah, for sure. Maybe if you're playing slap cup instead of rage cage where you stack the cups. But if you don't stack the cups in rage cage, you're doing it wrong. You have so many different words for drinking games than I do. Have you not played rage cage? No, rage cage is is boom cup. Boom cup. Do you stack the cups in boom cup? Yeah, which is the stacking version. Okay, yeah. It's slap cup, but you stack. Yeah, so we had yeah. at Rice, we had slap cup and then rage cage. And Rage Cage is fun because you start it off by chanting, Rage Cage, Rage Cage, Rage Cage, five, four, three, two, one, and then you go. And it's way better than Slap Cup because you don't make the floor totally gross. Exactly. Like Slap Cup you can only make in a terrible fraternity basement. That's the only place where you can play it. Yeah, I once went to a party in Seattle as a house party, and someone was setting up Rage Cage, and then someone who was drunk at the party was like, we got to play Slap Cup. Rage Cage is dumb, and everyone at the party was like, no, we're grown adults. <laughs> <laughs> we will play a distinguished drinking game. <laughs> it's the, the hierarchy of drinking games. That's good. <laughs> so Harry is the narrator, then thinks to himself that the guy from the flashback looked familiar, clearly the person from Dumbledore's picture. I love when Harry can't remember stuff from five pages ago. This has happened a couple times before. It's when he didn't remember Fenrir Greyback's name. It's like, Fenrir Greyback wasn't from that far ago, Harry. <laughs> he thinks it looks familiar, which confirms my theory, I believe. And Ron then theorizes that Voldemort is trying to get something else to turn into a Horcrux, which is not a bad theory, but I don't buy it. It seems too ridiculous and i feel like at this point voldemort is done making horcruxes i don't think he's on a big journey to get another horcrux clearly he's trying to solve this issue of wand stuff since he wasn't able to use his wand properly against harry so i don't think he's on a mission but that's ron's theory and that's the end of chapter 14 but now we get into chapter 15 which is called the goblin's revenge oh yeah oh no what if it's editing like we got to get up and stretch a little bit because it's time for wingardium at Ridosa. <laughs> Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by Skillshare. Look, we've all gone to school. Whether it's a muggle school or a wizarding school, there's always those subjects that you wish they taught that teachers simply didn't teach. Eric and I talked about it in this episode of Potterless. And don't you wish some of the classes you had were in subjects that actually fueled your creativity, your curiosity, your career, whatever it may be? Don't you just wish that existed? Well, it actually does, and it's called Skillshare. If you go to Skillshare.com slash Potterless, you can 
get two months of Skillshare for free. And that is going to get you access to a ton of amazing videos of experts giving you advice about a wide range of topics. They have classes on social media marketing, mobile photography, creative writing, illustration, time management, whatever you're looking for, Skillshare has it. Multitudes own Amanda McLaughlin, who has been on Potterless, who co-hosts Spirits, is on Join the Party. She has a Skillshare class that she teaches about podcast production and running your show and getting sponsors on your show. All of the things that we do at Multitude, Amanda can teach to you. So if you're an aspiring podcaster or a current podcaster, you can check that out. Again, all you need to do is go to Skillshare.com slash Potterless. You can get two free months of Skillshare classes. You'll get unlimited access to over 25,000 classes for free. So start learning and improving yourself and sticking it to your old school that didn't teach you cool stuff today. Today's episode of Powderless is also brought to you by Stitch Fix. Look, shopping can be an absolute pain, especially in the sense of time investment. You get ready, you put clothes on, you get in your car and you take the bus or the subway, whatever it is, to the mall or the stores. You try on stuff and nothing looks great and everything's too expensive and things just don't fit you perfectly. And not only did you not get any cool clothes, but you wasted a bunch of time and effort and maybe you brushed your teeth and did your hair, etc. Well, Stitch Fix can fix all of that by hooking you up with good stitches. And I mean clothes stitches, not medical stitches. Kelly got a box from Stitch Fix and she loved every single item from it, so she kept the entire box and because she signed up at stitchfix.com slash potterless, she got 25% off her entire box, which saved her $74. For some firsthand experience of how much she loved her box, here's Kelly Beckman. I felt like the stylist really took some time to look at what I said I liked and disliked and what I said I needed because I felt like the clothes they sent me knew me better than I knew myself. I got a rain jacket, which I told them I either want a neutral colored jacket or a bright, fun colored jacket. And they sent me exactly that. They sent me a blue rain jacket with yellow accents and I love it. And I put it on and I stuck my arm under the sink and it's totally waterproof. I just ordered my second box and I'm really excited to get that in the mail too. Wow, thanks Kelly. I'm really glad that you enjoyed your box and I'm sure that anyone out there listening can have an experience just as good as yours. If they go to stitchfix.com slash potterless, fill out all the information, get a box that they love, keep all five items, and then get that additional 25% off the box. So Harry gets up early and buries Mad-Eye Moody's eye under the gnarliest tree that he can find, which I think is very fitting. So Hermione and Harry think that they should get moving, and Ron agrees with the resolution that they should move towards a bacon sandwich, which I also think is fantastic. Me too. I always need to move towards a bacon, egg, and cheese at any time. Mm -hmm. So they go to a new spot, set up the Camp of Charms, and then Harry goes in to search for food under the invisibility cloak. But he returns empty-handed because there were Dementors, and he was unable to do Expecto Patronum. And when Ron asks why he couldn't do it, Harry says it wouldn't dot 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 come, which is too on the nose for Expecto Patronum, the spell that when you're very happy secretes a milky white substance. Oh, it wouldn't come. Come on. Mm. Uh. Mm. JK. <laughs> Mike, I'm worried that what you're doing in your personal life becomes stags and otters <laughs> and dogs. That worries me. <laughs> I think you should go see a doctor. So Harry feels embarrassed and ashamed. Ron and Harry then get into a bickering match since Ron is still hungry and Harry is defensive about failing to make a Patronus. But then Hermione realizes that it's because Harry is wearing the Horcrux on his neck. So once he takes it off, he immediately feels better. So, so they decide weird. to take turns wearing it. And this is where I don't understand why they don't just put it in the bag. Like, put it in the backpack. What are you doing? It doesn't make any sense. Oh, wait, I was depressed when I was wearing this thing? Oh, man, I guess we should all do it. Let's all be depressed. Ugh, it's so stupid. Hey, let's all be in a club where we all get depressed for 12 hours at a time. Yeah, if we spread out the depression, that's better. Ugh. Sounds fine. You know what? There's no other way that we can do this other than making sure that we shoulder this evil feeling of, like, terrible, terrible depression. I, I just can't think of any other way. Uh, so frustrating. I was thinking about they were worried about it getting stolen, but I'm like, if you don't just keep it in a bag or like on you, like near your person, like what are they worried is going to happen to this thing? And the thing is, just keep it in the bag. And then the second you hear anyone or anything, Accio, lock it, put it around your neck. Right. 
But even the bag, it's I mean, it's pretty secure. Like, yeah, it sounds like Hermione. It's not going to fly out. I mean, and the bag has other very important stuff in it. So it's not like they're not trying to keep the bag safe. Right. Ugh. Oy. Oy. Very dumb. Very, very dumb. They decide that they should move elsewhere to get some food and avoid the Dementors. So they go into a farm and then the narrator says, quote, where they managed to obtain eggs and bread. And that's it. Uh, I, I, you're going to need to go into a bit more detail, Mr. Narrator, because bread does not grow on a field. How did they get the bread? I was thinking it was like, OK, eggs, you can get that from some chickens, I guess. <laughs> oh, you know, bread, you know, from the cow that she gives bread. Yeah, from the bread tree, from the bread plant. From the bread bush. On the window where there's bread and it's steaming and you're like, mmm, smells good and you steal it. If they acquired bread, they had to have stolen it from someone's house. I assumed that they were stealing it. Yeah, but they didn't go into any detail. I want the heist scene where they break into the barn or the farmhouse or whatever and steal a loaf of bread. <laughs> but they just obtain <laughs> eggs and bread and then make scrambled eggs on toast. Akio bread. Akio skillet. Akio fire. Like well, they still have that Billy, whatever the hell it is. A so Billy can. Use that. Hey, Dottie. A billy can. Can you make eggs Dottie, and toast? Dottie, can you cook eggs in a Billy can? Wait, here's the other thing. They made toast. Did they get a toaster? I don't know if you've ever tried to make toast on not a toaster before. It is very hard. There's been multiple times in my life where I have not had a toaster in my kitchen, and I try to make toast just on a pan. It doesn't go very well. I don't I don't know. <laughs> Lots of questions. There's so many... Uh, 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 the, uh, I feel like I haven't had a dumb nitpick session in a while, and these two chapters have lots of things that raise questions. Good. Camping. Good. Uh, how did they make the toes? Uh, okay, anyway. Hermione feels super guilty about the whole thing, namely stealing food from people. She asks if it's stealing. She wants to leave money. But post-eating, they're all less grumpy, which is a hard same. Kelly can very much attest to the fact that when I don't have food, I don't necessarily become grumpy, but I just go into like autopilot where I'm like conserving my energy. So I just don't really have emotions. I'm just coasting. It's kind of like in Click, the Oscar snub from Adam Sandler. I'm kind of just like on autopilot when, when I don't have enough food in me. And then the second I eat some food, I feel great. And I'm me again. I just fasted 25 hours in a row for Yom Kippur. You were way on auto. You were super on autopilot. I was super. I, when I get really hungry or thirsty, I'm just kind of, I'm out of it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not necessarily an autopilot, but like I get very dreamy Ooh. and I'm just like, I can't focus at all. Yeah. It's like I'm on screensaver. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fun picture of a ball bouncing on all sides and that's all you're going to get. From me. There's a maze, but you don't get to control which way you go. Exactly. There's a bunch of pipes, and I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> that one was the weirdest. So here's a question. There's a big feast when the fasting of Yom Kippur is over, right? Kind of. I mean, you make it into a celebratory thing, just breaking the fast. And a lot of people get together because it's supposed to be a really solemn thing for 24 hours. Uh -huh. I was actually just explaining this before. Fasting for Jews... It's only like religious. It's not like the consecration or purification of the self. Sure. You're only doing it just to do it. So when it ends, you're like, oh, thank God that's over. Okay. Like, that's really it. But if you have a big feast at the end of Yom Kippur, is it called Nam Kippur? <laughs> you came up with that earlier today. And I know that you were just waiting for that for... <laughs> <laughs> for this conversation for you to say that. I'm so proud. I regret spending religious taxonomy on you. I don't. I know more things now. So they brainstorm where the next Horcrux could be. Ron scoffs at the thought of Albania when Harry and Hermione bring it up, <laughs> which is great. He's like, oh, yeah, it should be real easy to search an entire country. <laughs> Which is good. Ron keeps asking Harry not to say Voldemort's name, which upsets Harry. But this makes me think it's going to prove to be useful in the end. So I'm excited to see if this ends up working. Hmm. Harry suggests Hogwarts. And this is my resounding chorus of go to Hogwarts and talk to the Dumbledore painting, please. And thankfully, they kind of get into this later. So Hermione shoots the idea of Hogwarts down, saying that the whole point of Voldemort applying, according to Dumbledore, was to try to make a Horcrux at Hogwarts. But he never got the job there, so it's moot. He probably didn't make a Horcrux at the school. Over the next few days, they don't make any progress, but they keep moving around and they rotate who wears the Horcrux. And the narrator says that them dishing off who wears the Horcrux is like a game called, quote, pass the parcel. Is this what British people call hot potato? Yeah, <laughs> don't even need Dottie for this one. Pass the parcel? 
I've only ever heard this game called like Keep Away, Hot Potato, or Saluji, but Pass the Parcel? What's Saluji? It's just Keep Away. Okay. I've learned about Saluji from multiple rappers. <laughs> I first heard it in a song from Das Racist. I think it's like a New York thing because I've heard it in two rap songs by New York. Maybe. Uh. I mean, one was by the Beastie Boys and one was by Das Racist. So I think it's like a New York thing. <laughs> two rappers who grew up in New York. Yeah, for sure. But Pass the Parcel? Whoa. Hey, mate, you want to go play a little bit of Pass the Parcel? Hey, I don't want the parcel. I'm going to give it to somebody else. <laughs> now, I'd like to play orangutan in the center. <laughs> Isn't it so fun playing Pass the Parcel with each other? <laughs> Maybe afterwards we could play a game of Simon Declares. <laughs> <laughs> Accio Parcel. <laughs> Oh, man. So months go by. It's now autumn and they've made no progress. Ron is back on his bullshit and talks about how his mom can summon food out of thin air. Oh, my God, Ron. Saying that, no, she can't because of Gamp's law of elemental transfiguration. And I'm very glad that we're getting into the bare bones of how magic works halfway through book seven. (laughs) I know this is like physics. Just tell me physics. I just want to know how things work. Oh, goodness. Ron gets pissy. Hermione claps back saying that Ron never cooks anyway and then asks, is the only reason that I'm stuck with the cooking because I'm the girl? Yeah. And then Ron says, it's because you're the best at magic. And then Harry tells them to shut up because he can hear someone coming. Yeah, I was thinking that thing about Hermione having to make stuff because she was a girl back in the beginning of the last chapter because she's the one who has to go make tea for everybody. Yep. And then she becomes the one who gets all the food. And she's the one that's got the big purse. (laughs) Yeah. And she's the one who's responsible for all their things. She's responsible of taking care of Ron. She has to do like both camp responsibility stuff and like deemed women, female activities. Mm -hmm. So I definitely thought that when Hermione said that I had that, I had that written down. I'm like, Hermione's just doing women's stuff. Yes. So I'm glad JK Rowling kind of brought it up. So it's not necessarily Hermione's doing women's stuff. It's just Hermione's doing everything. Yeah. So they use their extendable ears to overhear the people that are approaching. Shout out to Fred and George. All of their inventions really coming in the clutch here. Yeah, pulling out more items from the bag of holding. That's mm-hmm. how you do. So they overhear two dudes trying to Accio Salmon and then fish hitting them in the chest, which is great. Wait, can I do an impression of the fish hitting them in the chest? Oh, okay. I, good. Yes, please. Okay, so you say Accio Salmon. And then I'll make uh, well, they're goblins. Spoiler alert. So I... <sighs> no, this is one of the humans. One of the humans says it. Oh, it's one of the humans? Oh, great. Okay, cool. Then I don't have to toe the line of trying to imitate the goblins but also realizing that the goblins at least in the movies are just like very bad jewish caricatures oh we'll get there oh we'll get there <laughs> okay i'll me. just be a normal person trying to catch a salmon aki oh akio salmon oh, <laughs> ah! a splat <laughs> if it was a comic book it would say splat curse splat <laughs> so yes it turns out to be a group that has two goblins and a person, and this first person, turns out to be Tonks' dad. It's Ted. Good old Ted. What up, Ted? What up, Ted Tonks? He reveals that he is on the run because he is muggle-born, and he didn't want to turn himself in on principle. And he's with someone else. Guess who? Dean Thomas. What up, Dean Which, Thomas? Whoa. Here's the problem with why Dean Thomas is with him, though. Because his dad left his mom when he was a kid, and he's not sure if his dad was a wizard or not. So J.K. Rowling made one of the few kids who was confirmed to be black that he is an absentee father? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Are you fucking kidding me, J.K. Rowling? Come on, we know we know for a fact that J.K. Rowling doesn't think about this stuff in oh, advance. You've got to like be, she, like, come oops. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. This made me so upset. Yeah. I got really mad. Like, how uh, how does she or no one editing this book realize that this is a bad stereotype and a bad trope? I, I don't know. Because uh. I, I think it, cause it's, like, framed in magic, so it's not, like, a race thing. But, of course, like, they're not. I'm not saying that. They're saying that. But it's, like, it's obvious if you look at it for more than 30 seconds uh. in, like, a critical lens that it's not. No one looked at this and thought it was not okay. Uh, just, uh. It made me, uh, I, I don't even want to like talk about it. It, just, it made me so mad. Yeah. It was just so stupid. Like, come on. Oh yeah. Well, well, I'll have this moment in about in like half a page. Yeah. <sighs> so there's also a dude there named Dirk. Unfortunately, it's not Dirk Nowitzki. No. How great would it have been if Dirk Nowitzki was there? That would make only us happy. Uh, I think it'd make a lot of, it'd make the population of Dallas very happy. <laughs> Dirk Nowitzki on the run from Voldemort. <laughs> 
is turn shoot around Jays and I mean Voldemort's that's face. yeah. How do you conquer Voldemort? At Dirk, just shoot a fadeaway jumper over him. Boom, Voldemort defeated. Floaters, <laughs> lots of floaters. This guy Dirk escaped while being directed to Azkaban, so he's on the run as well. The goblins say that they left because Gringotts is no longer solely controlled by goblins, and they were being bossed around by, I'm assuming, Death Eaters, saying that they were trying to treat them like house elves, and that goes across the rules of their race, and they peaced out. Do you want to get into your big old anti-goblin rant now, or are you saving it for a particular moment? No, I can do it now. Lay it on me before we move forward. Yeah, so we just need to reaffirm that goblins have very established, like, laws then we're going to talk about goblin made items so they have like very established activities that they do um the thing that really got me here was uh later when the two one goblin talks to another goblin in their own language and it's called gobbledygook which is a funny joke um or is that not it's a funny joke i thought it was a funny joke but if it's just confirmed i mean like these are pretty much already confirmed jews and they work in the bank and they have their own language that they have to each other that other people don't explain and they kind of have an accent pretty much just yiddish dog yeah like it's another thing it's like similar to the dean thomas thing like i'm sure she didn't do that on purpose she's like goblins have a language but it just it looks terrible yeah like we've talked about this before that especially in the movies but a lot of these details are confirmed in the books that like the goblins are pretty much just jews Mm, which is not cool so like anything that you do just to add to that case is not great yeah like the fact that they can speak to each other in a language and like it sounds weird is just like not good (sighs) yeah like, gobbledygook is a good joke. Is it worth it? Or, I mean, ultimately, the real thing is just, like, don't make the goblins a Jewish caricature, and then you can keep your gobbledygook joke, and then nobody's mad. Exactly. So then there's this weird thing about them talking in their own language and laughing about a joke that they don't get. Basically, what it boils down to is Ginny and some friends tried to steal the Sword of Gryffindor out of Snape's office, but the goblins know that it's a fake because the real sword of Gryffindor was goblin made many centuries ago. Yeah, goblins know what valuables are because they have very keen eyes. Oy. It's fine. Oy. It's fine. Oh. So Snape then put the sword in Gringotts at the request of Voldemort. So the fact that Voldemort wanted it to be kept hidden made me at first think it was a horcrux but then in a second we learned that it's more of a horcrux killer Mm -hmm. so by voldemort at least we assume directing snape to put it in gringotts to keep it safe we know that it's important so the goblins are laughing because whatever sword has been put into gringotts bank is a fake a good fake but a fake Mm -hmm. so from their conversation we learn that Ginny and her friends are all right the goblins say that they are lucky that snape didn't kill them given his history, which leads to a discussion of everyone except for Dirk agreeing that they don't believe what the prophet is saying, that Harry is guilty. And Dean even has this great moment where he steps up and says, oh yeah, Harry's the real deal. He's the chosen one for sure. Which I think is cool because Harry kind of hated Dean just because he was dating Ginny before. Mm. So I like that Dean's a good dude. Yeah. For sure. But Dirk tries to talk about how the prophet makes a good case against Harry. And Ted says, uh, if you want some truth, you should read the quibbler. Yeah, shout out to the quibbler. (laughs) Everybody else laughs. But then Ted says, have you read it recently, though? It's been great. It's been covering all of the stuff that the prophet ignores. So I think that's pretty sweet. I stand the quibbler. (laughs) Media. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what this is. This kind of makes me think of how BuzzFeed News is actually one of the better news sources. So they've got, yes, sure, all their silly stuff and all the listicles and the GIF things, blah, blah, blah. But actually, BuzzFeed News is a pretty reputable news source. Yeah, it's like this hard pivot from monsters to hard news. Very (laughs) similar. So that squad then leaves. Our squad gets to thinking. Hermione pulls out Phineas. Yes, the return of Phineas. I love me some Phineas. And says that he should know who swapped the real sword for the fake sword since he's been in Dumbledore's and now Snape's office, which it was only McGonagall's for like a day and a half. And it makes me very sad. So Hermione puts Obscuro over his eyes, which then puts a blindfold on Phineas Nigillus. And I love this. I love this so much. This raises so many questions. Not only do I want to know 
all of these laws of magical physics, but how paintings work is so crazy to me. <laughs> I mean, they go into some of the details here, and Phineas is like, how do you not know this? I have so many questions. So Phineas is as stay off my lawn as he always is, and he goes on to confirm that Luna and Neville helped Ginny, which I think is great. I love that this little threesome has come together. This is the kind of thing I could see a book written about the antics that the three of them got into during this semester of Hogwarts oh, yes. while Harry, Ron, and Hermione were camping. That'd be great. That is very much, I don't know if you've ever played the Uncharted games, but when Uncharted 4 came out, I think this happened in Uncharted 3 and Uncharted 4 where they made like downloadable content games where a couple characters go away and then they come back a lot later and then it's like what happened it's like oh we were taking care of this thing and then they made downloadable content games where you can be those characters taking care of that thing and it's two of the more eccentric characters so I would love some sort of book I'm sure there's fan fiction about it about just like the three of them heist movie trying to steal this sword and I would absolutely love it. I was just going to say, it was like, this does exist in written form. It's called fan fiction. Mm -hmm. But I want like an official, or maybe I don't. I'm really not high on J.K. Rowling in this chapter. So maybe I don't want an official one. Uh, yeah. I mean, J.K. Rowling will probably just do it just because. So Phineas starts getting sassier and sassier, which causes Harry to ask him, can you just bring Dumbledore here? And finally... Harry has done what I've been screaming at him to do since the beginning of the book is just talk to the Dumbledore painting. But Phineas says, oh, pff, what are you, stupid? Painting people can't travel outside of a painting that is outside of the castle because we've learned from Sir Cadogan that you can go from painting to painting, but not if the painting is outside of the castle. This seems very arbitrary and incredibly convenient how does a painting know that it's inside of a castle i think it's like in my head it's like all of the paintings are in like a senior community <laughs> where they're all like one community of people and they can all hang out but it's like you're calling in to the senior community and you can't like get them to go over to someone else's house and put them on the phone oh my goodness love it but if you were at like <laughs> hogwarts sunshine estates then you would be able to just like go over to anyone's house and have a sit down and play Mahjong. Hogwarts Sunshine Estates, where they play Wizard Shuffleboard, Exploding Shuffleboard. It's good. <laughs> Gob Shuffleboard. <laughs> so Phineas then, after Harry asks him very politely, says that the last time he saw the sword out of the case is when Dumbledore used it to break open a ring, which Harry and Hermione then shoot each other a look, but then decide that they can't say anything because they don't want Phineas to know anything. But he then leaves, and once he does, Harry and Hermione get hyped because they've now made a huge discovery. They have this really cute scene where they're going back and forth, just saying parts of sentences back to each other, finishing each other's sentences, but for an entire paragraph, it's phenomenal. Mm. And basically, Hermione says that goblin-made blades, quote, imbibe only that which strengthen them, meaning that it has basilisk blood inside of it, which is proof of how it killed the basilisk. And the basilisk venom is what was able to destroy the other Horcrux, the diary. So that's just all sorts of confirmation that now we know that maybe the sword of Gryffindor isn't necessarily a Horcrux, but it is the Horcrux killer, which is my favorite member of the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, Hor <laughs> Horcrux killer! The, ri the Rizza, the Jizza, the Horcrux killer, old dirty bastard. <laughs> what I realized from this scene is that our trio is best when each of them splits off as just two of them. Ooh. Like, I don't think they've had a lot of success just being all three of them together. I feel like Harry and Ron have a lot of their stuff together doing Quidditch. Oh. Hermione and Ron like have this deep friendship and budding relationship. And then Harry and Hermione get shit done. Yes. There it's the brains and like the charisma totally. being tied together here. But like as a trio, they are just not that good at getting things done. I yeah, I'd have to look back, but I this sounds right. It sounds like they're more productive when it's only two of them doing stuff. In fact, when it's Harry and Ron, they just like kind of goof off and Hermione picks up the slack. 
<laughs> yeah, maybe what it really is is that Hermione is just diluted by Harry and Ron. Oh, that's the so truth. So the that's fewer people the that are around Hermione, the better. <laughs> Unless it's yeah. Ginny or someone competent. No, there's only like three competent people in the wizarding world, though. I mean, you got Ginny, you got Hermione, you got the twins. They're not competent, though. Uh, I mean, they're very good at their job. And clearly their things are useful the three competent people in the wizarding world one is hermione two is Ginny, and three is mcgonagall that's it yeah that's literally it i mean you're not wrong <laughs> <laughs> so then they have the back and forth thing where they slowly realize dumbledore's brilliance and what they come up with is that dumbledore wanted to use the sword on the locket and that's why he didn't give it to harry and he knew that if he put it in the will they would confiscate it so he made a copy of it and put the fake one in the case and now the question is where did he hide the real one and my thought is that it's got to be some combination of the other two things that he gave to hermione and ron so somehow i feel like the put outer not the deluminator is going to be important and this children's book beetle the bard that hermione got also will be important who can say that's can my say? guess but we'll have to see who knows then things take an unfortunate turn we have this amazing high where harry and hermione have realized this great thing about the sword is how they're going to kill the rest of the horcruxes and they know that it's out there somewhere and they finally have some sort of direction in their quest but then ron sinks the whole ship and part of it is because he's wearing the locket at the time. But also part of it is just things that have been stewing for the past couple months. Mm -hmm. Ron says that the strip has sucked so far and their progress hasn't been that great. And clearly Harry doesn't have any sort of direction and they thought that Dumbledore probably told him more stuff. And Harry then brings up the two of them whispering behind his back. And earlier in the chapter, it said that there were a couple times when Harry would come upon the two of them. They would be talking amongst themselves and then quickly try to act like they weren't talking. So he knows something is up. And Hermione tries to deny this. And Ron confirms that they were doing it. And Hermione tries to say, no, it wasn't like that, blah, blah, blah. But then you just get into a Ron-Harry bicker fest. And Ron tries to make the case that Harry doesn't care enough about the Weasley family because Harry was basically unfazed by what happened to Ginny. Ginny got sent to detention with Hagrid. So Harry was like, all right, whatever. No big deal. It's Hagrid. It's going to be fine. It's the Forbidden Forest. No big deal. She'll be chill. But Ron cites, you know, the rest of his family being put in danger, George missing an ear, all sorts of stuff like that. And just saying that he doesn't think that Harry cares enough about the well-being of his family and he misses his family it's it's a valid argument but it seems more like a justification because he started the whole argument with like man this trip sucks and not the more valid point of you don't care about my family and i love my family and you're taking the risk of their health which is all your fault for granted yeah i think this kind of underscores that Ron has dealt with the least amount of tragedy out of the three of them. Mm -hmm. He's definitely the softest. The narrator makes a point that when Ron doesn't eat three meals a day, he like doesn't understand what that's like. So he gets very irritable when he's hungry. So it's like Hermione has dealt with just being shat on her entire life. And, totally. you know, we've read these books. Harry's life is pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. We're kind of getting the point here that Ron is soft and maybe too soft for this adventure at the moment. Yeah. It makes me sad, and this is kind of how I feel about what happened to Lupin a couple of chapters ago, where I think Ron is a good dude, and I think Ron is loyal, and I think this is just a moment of weakness type thing. I don't think that this particular action speaks to all of Ron's character, but it does make me a little sad, much like Lupin. I don't think Lupin is a bad guy, but... I don't know. It seems weird that J.K. Rowling kind of keeps having these moments where it's like, oh, here's this character that's pretty good and you'll like them, but let me just make them suck for a chapter. Yeah. So hopefully Ron can turn it around. But the rest of this chapter, not a good look for him. So they bicker back and forth. Ron and Harry are about to throw down and Hermione then uses Protego to split them apart. Harry tells Ron just to get out of here. He had been telling him throughout this argument, just leave. Why are you here? Blah, blah, blah. Ron asks Hermione what she is going to do. She says that she's going to stay. Ron says, oh, so you choose him, which, uh, which stings yeah. and makes Hermione very sad because probably Ron has some thoughts that Hermione's got a crush on Harry as 
everyone reading it does, and apparently J.K. thinks that Harry and Hermione should be together, which doesn't make any sense, but don't even get me started. Hermione's very distraught. She begs him to stay, but he leaves, and she starts crying, so Harry then kind of covers her up with blankets and stuff, tucks her in, gets her all sort of situated, and then they go to sleep. And that's the end of this chapter. And oh boy, what a what a fun, happy ending that we have here, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I just love it when my one of the three major characters leaves. That's so great. Uh, yeah. So you didn't even hit the worst burn. I thought of that entire uh, shouting match. What the parents thing? Yeah. Say it. Yeah. So this is what made me think that Ron was the soft. Not okay. When I say that Ron is a softest, just like he is the most accustomed to things being normal. Sure. And like his parents are very good. Arthur and Molly are extremely good parents. Yeah, he has a very good family situation. Exactly. He has a very uh, contained and like supportive family situation. Ron's one of those guys who just doesn't know that things are different outside of his family. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not Draco. He's not like super rich and has this other sort of privilege. Mm -hmm. But it's like Ron's very only understands himself. So So Ron says like Ron's accusing him of not caring about his family. He's like, oh, I won't bother myself about them. It's all right for you two, isn't it? With your parents safely out of the way and then harry bellows my parents are dead turns into batman for one sentence i mean his pa- yeah his parents are dead my parents are dead and hermione's parents are taking care i always forget what's what's what do you know about hermione's parents they are dentists what else do you know about hermione's parents oh they uh she tricked them into thinking that their lifelong dream was to go on a vacation to australia or something so they're they're gone right they're gone so it's like Hermione had to convince her parents to leave. Harry's parents are dead. And Ron's like, I miss my mom and dad. Yeah. So it's like, do you not understand what you're saying right now? It's like his own discomfort makes it a, l- attack otherwise. And he's the one who has, I guess he has the most to lose, but he's the one with the most support. The one thing that I can understand is we have to remember with all of these things, when it's so easy to get mad at them for making rash decisions, they're teenagers. They're oh, yeah. 17. Yep. And I got to be honest, I was very fortunate that I grew up in a very good family situation. Both my parents, I think, are very nice people. My sister is a very nice person. And I didn't realize until I made it further along by the end of high school that, oh, not everybody has a really good family situation. And I don't think it was, I don't think it made me less of a person, but I just didn't realize I, you know, thought everybody's family was nice and like just like that's how it worked you know so maybe ron just has the kind of thing where he hasn't realized it and i i can get it but ultimately you just got to realize like the kid's 17 and obviously you're gonna miss your parents regardless but also he is right like his family's going through some shit and it's all pretty much because of harry and harry didn't really show any care or concern for the well-beings of the weasleys so i get it but I don't think that this should lead to you bouncing and piecing out and just abandoning your two friends on this journey where they don't know what's going on. And even though Ron hasn't necessarily contributed a lot, like it would be really helpful to have someone else around that has been through some crazy situations with them before. Mm-hmm. Just having more hands would be best. Right. And what is he going to do? Exactly. He doesn't know magic that well. He doesn't have the invisibility cloak. He doesn't even have food. He doesn't have any sort of bag packed. He just bounces. And if he goes home, that could even put Harry and Hermione at risk because we are still unsure of what the whole trace situation is. So if he somehow gets back to the burrow, maybe they can find out where he came from when he disapparates. And maybe now Harry and Hermione are in trouble. So maybe he's putting his friends' lives at risk. But remember, Ron is the one who actually has the best excuse. Everyone thinks that he's like deathly ill with like spagger root or whatever that disease is Spattergroit. Spattergroit. So, I mean, he's the one who could feasibly just like hide out in the hollow and no one would notice. Yes. Like Harry and Hermione are on the fucking run. Yeah. Do you mean the burrow? Isn't the hollow? Oh, sorry. I meant the burrow. I meant the burrow. Yeah. The sh- yeah. The Shire. <laughs> yeah. Back in the Shire. I mean, if anyone could bail, it would be Ron. So this is the other thing. And it's like Ron has the most support and he's kind of leaning on it. Yeah. My concern is that when he disapparates, I don't know what the trace situation is. So they might be able to pinpoint, oh, he just disapparated from here. Right. I don't really know exactly if that's the case, but I'm just saying, in addition to him being selfish, he also could be harming his friends. 
Yeah. Which sucks. That would be bad. Having yeah. friends is good. Harming people is bad. Yeah. So unfortunately, this chapter kind of ended on a not cool cliffhanger type deal and a sad, sad moment. But I still think this was a fun episode of Pato. So thanks for coming along, Eric. No problem, Mike. I'm always happy to be on things that you lead me down the path initially. <laughs> is there anything in particular you want to plug? I know you do a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So I'm the co-host of Horse, the basketball podcast where we talk about everything except for really basketball. Mm-hmm. I'm also the dungeon master of Join the Party, a D&D campaign with a lot of really cool stuff like queer flip teens who kill people, uh, robots that don't know what they're doing, and warlocks who sound like car salesmen. I also just quit my job. I'm doing podcasting full time. So you can just like hit me up where I'm doing a lot of work with Multitude, which is the collective that we are a part of. You can hit us up at multitude.productions or you can just find me on social media at L underscore Silvero, E-L underscore S-I-L-V-E-R-O. It is my name if I was a Lucha Libre wrestler. See. So Eric, thank you so much for joining. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before they get hit in the face with a salmon... My Wizard parents on. are dead. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Wizard on. <laughs> <laughs> If you enjoyed Eric and I's banter this episode, you should check out our podcast, Horse. I promise it's not that much about basketball. If anything, it's just like a fun, silly history slash current events podcast that's basketball themed. It's very silly, and we're just trying to prove to everyone that anybody can watch the NBA, not just a big old sports head. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert. It is hosted by Mick Schubert. It is edited by Mick Schubert. It is produced by Mick Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopu, Rebecca Adam Frank Giotto, Marchis Motori, Larsic, Samantha Rose, Hwansan, Philly, Eugenia Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Abita Med, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Marie Lisa Sikin, Ariel Bird, Romina Rivadanira, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Dustin Wolin, Cooj, Audra, Eleanor Curlin, Sydney Cawthorn, Billy Hinton, Rossanne Batamana, Andrea Franz, Nikita Power, Lala Palmer, Chelsea Green, Taylor Armstead, Love Cash Longer, Ali Madsen, Cassandra Aponte, Roxy Chaos, Amelia Krauss, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Jessica Ann, Arnagutna Dodder, Tiago Costa, Daisy Curtin, Stodder, Jessica Jacob, Orchid Grower, Steve Trelor, Vivian the Owl, Takari Arant, Haley Hastings, Marino, Moster, Pinky Pan, Angelina Withred, Ross Marie Heise, Phineas Ebner, Lee Ganji Singh, Alex Bisholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Finn Stucky, Mosin Siddiqui, Grace Riggle, Sammy Shaw, Raul Pineda, Ingen Oddstadter, Mari Wynn, Brianne Wingate, Heidi Stoll, Alexandra Consulver, John Kotker, Jen and Juice, Noel De Soleil, Tao, Hala O'Keefe, Emily Tyrell, Michael Russell, Robin Fernandez, Patricia Colon, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Teal, Cena Schutzberg, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Ali Cat 29, Hallie Bowen, Veronica Bart- Tova, Kevin Harnoy, Lada B, Noah, Tracy Toya, Lucinda, Carlos Nino, Pam Webb, Nikki Amio, Colleen King, Jennifer Marklu, Friday J. Svedson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Raffle, Heather Fleischman, Vera Colotham, Carrie D. Bagason, Andrea Kroc, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Emily Gale, Ryan King, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Weekend of Dead Cat Ladies, Maya Gray, Addie Rye, Mark Body, Polly Burridge, Kimberly Savage, Srojan Thanme Gupta, Brittany Gutierrez, Sarah Shecker, and Can't I Potter? Web designed by Kelly Beckman and the music. Music is by Bettina Campomanis. If you want to find us at social media, you can go to facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit.com slash r slash potterless. Any and all information about the show is at potterlesspodcast.com, and bonus content lives at patreon.com slash potterless. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, a wizard on!